Hello, and welcome to the Community IT Innovators Technology Topics Podcast, where we discuss nonprofit technology, cybersecurity, tech project implementation, strategic planning, and nonprofit IT careers. Find us at communityit.com. Thank you for joining this Community IT Podcast Part 2. You can find Part 1 in your podcast feed if you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to the Community IT Innovators presentation on data cybersecurity at nonprofits. Um, Today, we're going to talk specifically around a subsection of cybersecurity and keeping your data secure in all the tools that you use that store the data that is important to your organization. My name is Carolyn Woodard. I'm the Outreach Director for Community IT, and I'm the moderator today. I'm very happy to hear from our experts. So, Matt, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, Sure. Great. Thanks, Carolyn. It's great to be here uh, on October Cybersecurity Month. My name is Matthew Eshelman, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Community IT. Uh, And I'm happy to be joined by my colleague, David Deal. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, I'm a founding partner at Build Consulting, where I've been since 2015. And uh, my work is as a virtual CIO for mid-sized and large nonprofits. Uh, So one of the things I focus on in that role is cybersecurity. Um, All right. So we have another poll that we're going to do. Um, So at your organization, who is in charge of your cybersecurity? Um, So this one is a single answer. So you have to choose (laughs) um, the the one that is the closest to, to your answer. And your response options are it's unclear or no one. And uh, please don't be embarrassed or ashamed to uh, click that as your answer because we're we're all here for you um, and you've come to the right place to, you're in a webinar around cybersecurity so you know that you need to do it. And that's, I think a lot of people are in that same boat. Um, the second option is the application owners. Um, so like if you have, I don't know, Salesforce or something like that, that's owned by a staff you know, a role or a department, um, then that is where the cybersecurity for that tool would lie. Um, The third option is a CIO, a CISO, a VCIO, or a similar title. That's the chief information um, officer or a virtual chief information officer. So someone at that, you know, kind of a high executive level is responsible for your cybersecurity. Um, The fourth answer is an MSP, uh, managed services provider or IT provider, um, such as community IT. So outsourced IT is in charge of your cybersecurity at your nonprofit. Um, An MSSP is the next option. That's a managed security services provider. So specifically around security. Uh, Another option is other. And then the final option is not applicable. And Matt, would you mind reading the results? Oh, this is great. It's always the, the big reveal here. So uh, so about 15% of folks said said unclear or no one. So I'm glad you're here at this webinar and maybe it'll give you some inspiration to go and follow that up. Um, then, uh, you know, about a quarter of the audience says, you know, that that does sit at the, that senior senior level at the CIO. So that's great. Um, then another 21% pushing it on to the MSP, the IT provider, and then a smaller proportion of 12% saying that they actually had a managed service or managed security services provider. Um, then we've got about 15% saying the application owners themselves are in char- charge of cybersecurity uh, and then kind of followed by, by others. So uh, kind of all over the place in terms of where that responsibility lies within the organization, which is I think mirrors mirrors our expect or mirrors our you know experience as well. Our experience, yeah. I was going to say that um, you know we often say when working with nonprofits, like you can make some generalizations, but so many nonprofits just operate in different sizes, different environments, um, have different technical you know needs and complexity. So it's not unusual to see a wide range. And I think also we would say there's no 
there's no universal, like you should always do it this way. It should always be mm-hmm. at the C level or it should always be at the outsourced level. So um, I think that's reflective um, for sure. Um, but that, thank you so much for sharing that with us, um, all of you, because it, it really helps us, you know, kind of see how, um, how different it is at different organizations. Um, and that leads us into our next topic, which is we wanted to take a little bit of a deeper dive into governance and training best practices and expand a little bit on that framework um, that we talked about briefly in the first half of the webinar and just um, go a little bit deeper into what kind of policies and governance you need and then some ideas on training. Um, All right, so I think, uh, Matt, you had some questions for for David about this. Yeah, you know, I think I started to talk a little bit about, you know, it's not just technology solutions here. So, you know, from your perspective, you know, having that CIO role with a lot of different organizations, you know, what what are, you know, good examples of, of, of good data governance and kind of how is that carried out at an organization? Well, I I think the organizations that do this the best uh, have some policies, some statements around the data that they want to collect, because it's really easy to just keep adding over the the months and years to the data you want to collect and not really using it. Uh, And and so uh, both for that reason and also, you know, when you think about data that you absolutely don't want to retain in your system, social security numbers, credit cards, things like that. uh, do you have policies making it clear that that's not the the type of information that you'll you'll gather? So, um, really, that's part of it. Being clear about what data we're going to collect for what purpose, and revisiting that periodically to stop collecting things that you're not using, uh, that is important. Uh, being clear on retention requirements: what data are we going to keep for how long? You know, really, don't keep all data forever. <laughs> uh, you know, there's certain compliance requirements for. How long you need to keep, uh, you know, financial data and some things like that. But uh, otherwise, it probably doesn't benefit you and probably just creates risk to uh, keep data around for a really long time. Um, The data inventory, of course, is something we mentioned earlier to talk a little bit more about that. Um, You know, the things I look for, and this is one of those spreadsheets I'm glad to see, by the way. Uh, You know, what, where is their data stored? What data is there? Uh, at the very least, who is the business owner, the business person who's responsible uh, for that data, um, what sort of backup and retention methods are in place for that data, uh, but just being clear on that governance piece of who's responsible for it uh, can be really helpful. Uh, and you know, governance really includes things like um, user administration or what I might call identity and access management, who should be able to access what. Um, especially as an organization grows, you need to start to think about uh, as convenient as it is for everyone to have access to everything, you really need to start to to apply some least privilege uh, techniques to who can access what, Uh, really limiting people to the things that they need to access uh, to be able to do their job. Uh, So role-based access controls in your programs begin to enter the picture there. Um, But, you know, identity and access management, I want to put in the plug for SSO, single sign-on that you mentioned earlier. I can't tell you how much easier that makes it, both from the IT administration side, but also the end user side. Uh, When we're dealing with things like CRM adoption, just having single sign-on into your CRM, you, you, I think people would be surprised what a big difference that makes in people's inclination to, to use it to, to capture activities, for example. Plus, it's a big plus when uh, you know managing um, cybersecurity risk, being able to get people out of systems uh, when they leave the organization, and and things like that. Um, and then you know finally, I think data quality and looking at data quality is also a part of uh, of data governance. Um, it's it's maybe not as much of a cybersecurity consideration, but uh, uh, are you keeping your data data tidy? Uh, I'll bet the same organizations that are doing that are probably the same ones that have a data inventory and are paying attention to that type of thing. Yeah, I would say I really like that. Yeah, the user administration piece, just kind of piggyback on that, you know, the role-based access controls, kind of all of those are uh, ways for the organization to kind of think about it, kind of put it down on paper, so to speak, and have an intentional approach so that um, 
you know, not everybody has access to everything. And I'm, I think, you know, organizations have, have made pretty big strides in this area, at least from kind of what I've seen in terms of being intentional about um, and specific in terms of that, those access roles. Well, continuing along the lines of uh, things that aren't specifically about technology, uh, you know, I, I, we, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, the importance of training and so much of cybersecurity is about the behavior of staff members. So Matt, what are, what is community IT doing and what are you seeing your, your clients do for cybersecurity training? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, I think from the cybersecurity perspective, you know, most of the the kind of security issues or compromises that we see are still kind of coming through um, coming through email or coming through um, you know password attacks or or kind of account compromise on the primary system. So I'll say you know knock on wood we have not yet seen a case where uh, you know a database user account was compromised, um, but typically there's you know kind of an incursion through the primary system, and so you know. Going back to what are the fundamentals, you know, having that security awareness training practice um, for staff to keep those topics front of mind, uh, I think is absolutely essential. You know, we use Nova for, uh, I think they have a, a good um, kind of product. Uh, there's a lot of other security awareness training um, platforms that are out there. But I think from our perspective, uh, we like to do a mix of, you know, kind of test phishing to kind of see how, you know, how staff are performing, you know, who's susceptible, who may need some extra education, um, combined with relatively, um, you know, short, but kind of frequent training engagements. So again, our approach typically is to have quarterly trainings, um, just to kind of get different and new concepts in front of staff. It doesn't take a lot of time, but we really want security to be uh, at top of mind for, for folks. And so that's the approach that we've taken. Uh, and I would certainly encourage other organizations to adopt that, you know, intentional training um, approach. Um, I think kind of focusing on the fundamentals of, uh, you know, general security awareness training, you know, I think then you start looking at some specific training for how the application is configured and um, and used. So, you know, Dave, maybe you can talk maybe more specifically about some of the training resources that are available at the application level. Um, but then just to kind of wrap up, again, I think it's, it's really important for organizations to have some policies and procedures in place to identify, you know, what is going to, what are we going to do as an organization when we think we have a problem? How are we going to go about that? Who do we talk to? Who's responsible on our side? How do we interact with our stakeholders? Um, and, you know, make sure that that is defined and tested in advance because, you know, the, the common thread is it's, it's not a question of like, if you're going to have a, a, net, a compromise or a breach, but it's a question of when. Um, and so being able to test and define those policies and procedures in advance of a crisis, I think is really important um, because it can give you a lot more confidence. Um, and it may even be a requirement if you are uh, following up on on procuring cyber liability insurance. You know, some of those things are just expectations of those policies. So that's kind of the the foundational elements that that we talk about or think about when we're looking at designing an effective security awareness and security training program for an organization. I think specifically from the business application perspective, uh, both administrator training and end user training comes to mind. And what I mean by administrator training, uh, really, you know, number one, making sure that for any application you have, there is an application owner, someone who understands that by putting the organization's data in that application, they need to take responsibility with, or work with a, a CISO or some person who does have responsibility for the cybersecurity of that data. And they need to be looking at things for that application, like is two-factor authentication available? Do we have it turned on? Uh, who's using it? What do they have access to? Uh, what can they export? Uh, you know, getting back uh, to this idea of data loss prevention. <laughs> um, as I think about an HR information system, for example, how many HR people do you know who are exporting full, you know, staff lists with salaries and or social security numbers or things like that to a spreadsheet that then sits in their OneDrive or their Google Drive or worse, their local hard drive. Um, 
Uh, so there's some end user training, I think, about, uh, you know, I'm not going to say there's never a business need to do an export of sensitive data, but if you're going to do it, there's certain ways to handle it to make sure that you're treating it securely and you're not leaving copies of this data uh, sitting around everywhere. Um, but th there's no generic uh, security training that I know of for really general use of business applications because it really depends upon the business application. So the nonprofit itself and whoever's responsible for that application and cybersecurity for cybersecurity for that application really need to think about how do we need to train the administrators and the end users to be responsible uh, with this data. That's a great segue, I think, into our next um, topic on the technology involved. I know David, as Build always says, the technology usually comes last in an organization um, around what you're trying to do. And then you want to find the technology that will do that thing instead of choosing the technology first and doing whatever the technology says in a topic like cybersecurity, um, your organization will probably have a lot of vendors reaching out, trying to sell you tools um, before maybe you've done an assessment around what you really need. And as we've said today, I think several times within the tool or platform that you're using, there may be security like specific to that. So you don't need an additional tool or you might need something like the third party backups that we talked about today. So I wanted to use some of the time we had left to review some of the terms that nonprofit staff might come across, how some of these tools work. We have a question um, in Q&A and we got a question at uh, registration around Okta. So I'm hoping that um, you can touch on that and maybe some of the other tools. Um, so go ahead. I think, Matt, this is one of your areas of um, expertise. Uh, yeah. So uh, Okta which is a single sign-on vendor. Okta is actually um, a scientific term. It's a it's a way to measure the degree of cloud cover. So it's a very whoever named that for your cloud single sign-on was that was pretty that was pretty smart. Um, but that gives you a way to easily sign on and and kind of have access to all these single sign-on applications. It is what would be called a third-party vendor, which would be distinct from um, you know, Microsoft with their Azure or Intra ID, which is also gives you the ability to do single sign-on. Um, same thing with Google Workplace. You can use that as a single sign-on platform. Um, we see, I would say, the majority of customers that we're working with are using the native tools um, for primarily, I would say, for cost reasons. Um, there are some organizations that have chosen to implement third-party single sign-on solutions and identity providers. Um, Okta is probably the biggest name, uh, one of them, but one login. There are others. Um, my sense is that there can be some benefits with, you know, from usability to going to the third-party providers, although that introduces some complexity and kind of yet another vendor that you need to rely on for uptime and identity is very, very critical because if you have an outage, then it kind of takes out access to all of your applications. And so uh, I tend to, you know, prefer to kind of stick with the core vendors for that reason, um, just because, you know, if Okta has an outage, if one log has an outage, you know, that really impacts, has a pretty outsized impact in your access. and. Uh, you know, uptime and availability is kind of the number one um, kind of feature of those solutions. So, um, and and I think, you know, both Microsoft and Google have, have made improvements in terms of the usability of those tools. And so I would, you know, kind of stick stick with the, the main vendors there. Matt, I would say the, the two I see the most are Okta and Azure AD or now Enter mm -hmm. ID. And I'm sure mm -hmm. Microsoft will change the name again next year too, right? <laughs> um, uh, but uh, you know, traditionally, the, the my thought on the argument for Okta was uh, both the usability side, uh, end users found it more usable than, say, an Azure AD, and also the number of applications and the the level of, uh, like, how easy it was to connect with more applications. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's why some organizations will, you know, pay the not small bucks to uh, get a third-party solution like Okta, in, in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, part of the question was around um, open open source solutions as well. Do you have thoughts on on that? I am not familiar with 
that the the company that was mentioned there in terms of kind of the open source tool, I will say that the standards that are used for SSO integration are, I guess, technically open standards. The other piece I think that was raised in another chat question was just to acknowledge that for some vendors, they make the single sign-on feature uh, a premium add-on. So, you know, it could be, you know, if you have Slack as an organization, unless you've got the business version or, you know, the upper tier, you may not be able to do single sign-on with integration with that application. You know, I think it's something that, you know, vendors should should make free and kind of include it as a core uh, you know, part of the product, because I think from a security perspective, it, it's so vital. Um, but that is something to to be aware of is that to get access to the SSO feature, that may be another couple dollars a month or a different tier. Um, and so, you know, that's something that's, you know, at least worth considering whenever you're looking at uh, these different solutions. I would just add the importance of that. Like I, I would really advocate for organizations to really you know, spend a little bit more money for increased usability and increased cybersecurity. That's probably mm -hmm. one of the better investments you can make and a, a pretty solid return on that investment for usually not that much more. Mm -hmm. Well, we said we would talk about terms and we're <laughs> going to run out of time in just a little bit. So I <laughs> wanted to make sure to touch on some of these things. I know multi-factor authentication, we've talked about elsewhere and we have some stuff on our website about it, but Matt, um, you wanted to talk a little bit about authentication versus SMS. And also I know mm. those security keys, like the actual physical key that you can use. Do you have advice on that? Yeah. So actually, this is something that Microsoft is, is actually driving right now uh, in terms of or removing the ability to use text messaging as a secondary uh, MFA source. So multi-factor authentication combines something that you know, which is your password, along with something you have. Microsoft now is saying, hey, the Microsoft Authenticator app on your phone would be a good option. Um, security keys are becoming more and more popular, and I will uh, make a pitch for them. So it looks something like this. So there's some open standards. So FIDO security key, you'll, you may see it see it named as, um, but this is a much, you know, kind of the best method of multi-factor authentication because it is very hard for this to be spoofed. So we have started seeing some very, very sophisticated um, kind of hacking attacks or web proxy attacks that actually can steal the multi-factor authentication token from your phone. Uh, it cannot steal it from this physical key. So, um, you know, so, you know, for organizations that are very concerned about the their identity and access management piece, I think these physical security keys are a good way to provide, you know, a really high level of security. It also has the benefit of you don't have to ask your staff to install an app on their phone. Um, and kind of that raises some BYOD concerns. But again, uh, you know, multi-factor authentication is critical. You know, a good solution is certainly to use the Microsoft Authenticator app for those of you in Office 365, you know, and for, you know, 20 or $30, you can get a physical security key uh, and really up your game for uh, for protecting your identity against, you know, those kind of sophisticated attacks. So I know we've talked a little bit about um, single sign-on a couple of times and backups. We went over that as well, um, but we haven't hit as much on encryption. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about that, Matt, about um, HTTPS, which I think a lot of us know, but um, what do nonprofits in general need to know about encryption? Mm -hmm. I think the good news is that, you know, encryption in transit where a lot of these cloud solutions is already provided, right? So that's the SSL or TLS. So you see the lock in the website whenever you're accessing your Salesforce database. You know, that means that as you, you know, the data goes from your computer to their servers, that data uh, can't be, you know, spied on by by anybody else that kind of may be in the network. So so those things are, are pretty uh widespread now. And if you're filling out your cyber liability insurance applications, it's easy to say yes, end-to-end -end encryption um, or in-transit encryption is enabled. Um, what may not be quite as apparent is encryption at rest. And so that's really talking about this idea of when the data is saved somewhere, is that 
encrypted at rest. So I think for a lot of the cloud hosted systems, again, that answer is yes. But if you have a database or a web, you know, an application that you are still hosting yourself, you need to, you know, take extra additional steps to make sure that that data, when it's saved on the server or the computer is encrypted. Um, BitLocker uh, is a term on the Windows side or File Vault for the Mac side that will encrypt your hard drive so that if, again, your device is lost or stolen, you know, if somebody takes your hard drive and like tries to get data off of it, it's going to be unrecognizable. So, um, you know, and I don't know, Dave, maybe you can provide some insight. So there are, I know, some tools within products like Salesforce that do some, again, more encryption within the database itself. Yeah, for example, in the Salesforce world, there's Salesforce Shield uh, that helps with everything from encryption to monitoring who's doing what in the system uh, and is a really helpful uh, sort of cybersecurity tool there. I did want to ask, because I know we're running out of time, uh, since substantially every website you go to now and is protected by, you know, you'll see the HTTPS at the front of the website mm-hmm. name. Um, and every web ap- application you're using, almost all of them are, are using that. Is a VPN really as necessary anymore for anything other than connecting back to a local network? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I must admit, I've never been a huge fan of, of kind of VPNs to provide secure internet. I think it's a good idea if you have security and privacy concerns that you should just travel with your own hotspot um, and and kind of rely on that for connectivity. I think VPNs do have a case. I will say as somebody that like looks through lots and lots of security logs, VPNs can be super problematic because they, you know, especially if it's not a, a corporate VPN service, like it can make you appear like you're connecting from, you know, Oregon and then you're connecting from Montana and then you're connecting from New York. And then all of a sudden, like all these rules that we have in place to look at, you know, unusual travel or location, like all go haywire. Um, so VPNs, um, you know, I think certainly do have a place. I think if you have a, an organization that says like, we really need to provide trusted internet access and we're going to be really um, defined about where we allow people to connect from, having a corporate VPN solution that allows you to do that is is good. But, you know, just having a VPN to protect your internet traffic at you know, while you're at Starbucks, uh, you know, maybe not as beneficial as maybe as it, as it used to be. And then we have one more term on this um, slide, the data leak or loss prevention. And I know we touched on it earlier. Um, I kind of got the sense from you both that this was more of a policy issue. If you have more sensitive data or maybe you're operating in a sector in which you have more privacy concerns. Um, would you talk a little bit about um, DPL? Matt? Or Dave? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so DLP or data loss prevention typically described as more of like um, uh, a way to provide some automated, and again, this is maybe a, a you know, kind of the, the use of AI, right? So there are kind of systems that are built into Google and and Office 365, those are the ones I'm most familiar with, that basically can read or look through the content of your file systems and flag things that look like credit card numbers or social security numbers or banking account or routing information, and then they can take actions. So again, you know, a common control is to say, we're going to block anything that looks like a credit card from being sent in an email outside the organization. So again, if you're or a social security number, right? So maybe some, your HR person has an export of all the staff with their social security numbers. They go hit attach on that file. The DLP rules all of a sudden will trigger and say, hey, this looks like it has sensitive information. Like, are you sure you want to send that? Or, you know, they could block it. Um, and again, so it's a way to provide some technology controls that can help support the policy choices that an organization has made. If they said, yes, like, we have sensitive information in our database. You can't export that and save it on your computer. You can't save it on the network. The DLP rules can help be that technology enforcement uh, on the policy decisions of the organization. And I'll just quickly add one thing about DLP. Like you, you really need to be thinking about the different ways that data might exit your system or your organization. So certainly email, um, but uh, also, you know, now we have Slack and Teams that are used for external collaboration a lot, or 
Maybe someone's just doing a big export from a CRM database and taking that spreadsheet with them, uh, things like that. So there are DLP solutions built into the products, uh, into many products that can help with this. And then there are also third-party DLP solutions uh, to, you know, to be considered if you want a more comprehensive approach to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys both so much for taking us through that. I um, really appreciate it. Um, so I'm actually going to, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to head right to our learning objectives and just recap for people. Um, we wanted to help you understand what you'd need to do to secure your data at your nonprofit, learn some risks, learn some best practices, understand data governance and policies, and be familiar with um, cybersecurity technology terms and concepts. I think we did pretty well at that. Thank you, Matt and David. I just wanted to thank you again so much for your time sharing your experience and expertise with us today. Thank you, everyone who attended the webinar. Um, thanks again. Thank you for joining this Community IT Podcast Part 2. You can find Part 1 in your podcast feed if you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Community IT does these free webinars and podcasts for our community, and we love sharing our knowledge and experience. If you have more questions or are having trouble with your IT at your nonprofit, please get in touch with us on our website, www.communityit.com, so we can start a conversation or schedule an assessment. Downloading any of our free resources there will get you signed up for our webinar reminders, and you can attend our next webinar in real time and ask our experts your own questions. If you love podcasts, please subscribe and leave us a rating to help others find this leadership resource for nonprofits.